Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today's topic is punishment strategies. And before continuing our conversation on stage games, as we were talking about last lecture, I first want to revisit the last lecture from the first unit. You might remember this game, the free money game. This is one of those really strange games that has an even number of equilibria. One equilibrium is where both player one and player two say yes, and the other equilibrium is where both player one and player two say no. There are no mixed strategy Nash equilibria here. There are only those two pure strategy Nash equilibria. Now, looking at this game, there's some obvious reason for confusion and puzzlement in that while definitionally, remember, Nash equilibrium is simply an application of a definition. Definitionally, there are two Nash equilibria here, but we might only expect one equilibrium to be played in practice, that yes, yes equilibrium. And to give a voice to that, I want to quote a YouTube, uh, YouTube user, Jimmy20097, who said, I don't understand why both players would even bother voting no, no, when they could obviously know that voting yes, yes would make them both better off. I mean, voting no, no just doesn't make sense. And to f further illustrate Jimmy's point here, if we go back to those payoffs, you'll see that if we were expecting to play that no, no Nash equilibrium, you could just as easily change your strategy to yes. And at worst, you'll get the same payoff as before. You'll still get zero. And at best, if the other player were to do something random or accidental and say yes with even the tiniest fraction of a probability of the time, say yes, you're actually going to be better off in that case. So switching your strategy from yes to or from no to yes can only hurt you or can only help you. It cannot possibly hurt you. And so that's really what's underlying Jimmy's criticism here is that there's no risk and only reward available to you for saying yes. So why would you ever want to vote no? Should we just get rid of this no no equilibrium outcome as as something that we should never expect to happen? And as it turns out, it's a little bit more complicated than that. These no-no strategies, that no-no Nash equilibrium, is actually very useful as a punishment equilibrium. And to illustrate that, we will now get back into those stage games. So think of a two-stage game where the first stage is a prisoner's dilemma, and the second stage is that free money game from before. I've just added a couple of points extra to the reward-reward outcome, whereas before it was 1-1, one, one, now it's 3-3. Three, three. And just to quickly verify, stage 1 is in fact a prisoner's dilemma. Note that for player 1, 4 is greater than 3, and 2 is greater than 1. So that means defect strictly dominates cooperate for player one. And for player two, four is greater than three and two is greater than one. Defect strictly dominates cooperate for player two as well. So this defect defect outcome is the unique Nash equilibrium in a one shot game. And that is worse for both parties than this cooperate cooperate outcome. So this is a prisoner's dilemma. Okay, so from before we know that playing a Nash equilibrium in each stage game is a subgame perfect equilibrium. So a subgame perfect equilibrium to this two-stage game is to defect in stage one, to play your strictly dominant strategy in stage one, and then to reward in stage two, regardless of the outcome in stage one. And in fact, if we're limiting both parties to only playing that reward reward Nash equilibrium in the second stage, this is the only thing that can happen. However, if we're a little bit more lenient here and we can actually use those punishment strategies as a method of enforcing cooperation in the first stage, we can actually see welfare improvement. So notice that in this equilibrium, you get two from the first stage, three from the second stage. That's a total of five overall. And I'm now going to show you that you can actually end up in a better equilibrium. This is a strictly inferior equilibrium to another equilibrium that requires the use of punishment strategies. And to see this, well, this is it. In this subgame perfect equilibrium, you cooperate in stage one and you reward in stage two if and only if both players cooperated in stage one. Now notice that in this equilibrium, we both cooperate in the first stage, we both reward in the second stage. That gives us a payoff of three plus three, which is six, which is strictly greater than the payoff in this equilibrium, which was two plus three is five. So this equilibrium is strictly better than the equilibrium where we were disallowing that punishment strategy from occurring. However, it has to be the case that we're willing to punish in the second stage, otherwise this equilibrium falls apart. And the reason that this equilibrium works is because if I were to defect in that first stage, instead of cooperating, I defect, 
then what happens is that triggers the punishment strategy. Because notice that it says in this subgame perfect equilibrium, you reward in stage two if and only if both players cooperated in stage one. So if I were to defect in the first stage instead of cooperate, well, you're still cooperating because you're holding your strategy constant. I get four in that first stage, but then because I defected on you in the first stage, that triggers your punishment, right? And so instead of going to the reward reward outcome before, we now journey over to that punish punish outcome and we both get zero. And so my payoff for the entire game is four plus zero. In other words, it's only four. And so I'm willing to stick to this cooperate outcome or this cooperate strategy in the first stage of the game because I'm going to be rewarded for it in the second stage. So this is neat because in that first stage, you're not playing the strictly dominant strategy. You're actually playing a strictly dominated strategy in the first stage. But because of this cooperation contingent reward in the second stage and this threat of punishment if you do something nasty in that first stage, you actually get an equilibrium that pays better than the other side. And so what we're seeing here is essentially that the punishment strategy is good. Remember that the prior criticism, to boil the prior criticism down, is that the punishment equilibrium is unrealistic because there is no risk to choosing a reward strategy instead of the punishment strategy. But if that's true, we can't enforce cooperation in the second stage. We're stuck playing that 3-3 payoff, that reward-reward outcome, which gives us no incentive to not defect in the first stage. So that's really bad because you end up without cooperation in the first stage and you end up with an outcome that's worse for both parties. Instead of both of us getting five, or sorry, rather, instead of both of us getting six, we cut down our payoffs to both getting five, which is mutually worse for both of us. And so what that means is that this inefficient strategy, this punishment strategy where no one wins is actually allowing for efficiency to occur. The inefficient strategy allows for efficiency. That's really neat, kind of strange. And it works out because as, as you play out the game, you don't end up actually ever having to punish anyone. You don't end up in this situation. You end up in the better outcome because of the threat to diverting to that outcome if there is any sort of foul play in the first stage. So punishment strategies are really useful, and you shouldn't just discard this punish, punish, Nash equilibrium in the second stage because it's inefficient in the second stage. There might be some further and more complicated game that's going on here that requires that punish punish strategy to be available, or that punish punish Nash equilibrium to be available. So that's it for this time. I'll see you next time. Take care.